Good morning. I have some announcements for you. Uh, first of all, there's a, a oops, as Karen put it, in the bulletin. Uh, there will not be coffee after the service this morning, but there will be fellowship. So uh, do uh, stay around for fellowship. And after fellowship, we'll have a Sunday school. Uh, we'll be looking at a book called Get Real, uh, which I hope you'll find is a, a welcome and natural approach to thinking about sharing your faith with your neighbors. Also on uh, Wednesdays, uh, we have a prayer meeting and Bible study. Uh, we are taking up the book of Matthew as a manual for disciples. So please uh, join us for uh, prayer. We'll be doing this through Zoom. Uh, so if you need the Zoom uh, link, uh, please let me know. Uh, last thing, uh, we have a picnic at 4 p.m. today. Uh, in which I get to welcome you as you welcome me, and also um, I think we'll be honoring uh, John Dykeson as well during that time. So uh, come out at 4 p.m. Uh, in the parking lot for uh, barbecue. Okay. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will tell the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I will not restrain my lips. Please pray with me. Our great God, to you we lift our souls. To you we offer our praise and prayer our worship and thanksgiving, even our very lives. Make your ways known to us. Show us the path on which we should walk. Lead us in your truth and teach us. For you alone are the God who saves, the God in whom we trust, the one on whom we wait. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us worship God. Please stand to sing, we have come into his house.
Amen. Please be seated. Please pray with me. Uh, there'll be a time for silent prayer and confession as well. Most holy and merciful Father, we trust in Christ the Savior with whom we are united and in whom we have died and been raised to newness of life so that sin no longer reigns over us. Yet we acknowledge our spiritual warfare and remaining sin. By the Spirit we cry, Abba, Father, for we wander from your ways, waste your gifts, and fail to look to the interests of others. We have forgotten your grace and love for us in Christ Jesus, and so we confess our sins, corporate and silently, we confess our particular offenses before you. Father, forgive us for displeasing you and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Grant us grace to put our sins to death. Lift us up to love you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. As we walk by faith and by your spirit, teach us to keep all the commandments of Christ our Lord. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Through the blood of Christ Jesus, our Savior and Lord, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Indeed, the riches of God's grace have been poured out upon us, and he will conform us to the image of Christ by the life-giving Spirit. Praise God, who has chosen and made us his own. Praise God, who forgives and cleanses us. Praise God, who blesses us beyond our imagination. Now let us sing, Rejoice, Ye Pure in Heart. Uh, we'll be singing verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. Verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. <laughs> Amen. 
Will you please uh, pray with me? Our great God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light for our path. As we now hear your word read and preached, to give us grace to trust you in love and strength to follow the path you have set for us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The text for the sermon this morning comes from Matthew uh, chapter 28. Um, I won't always take a whole chapter, uh, but this is uh, my first Sunday, and I think we need all of it. So I'll be reading uh, Matthew 28, verses 1 through 20. Matthew 28, beginning with verse 1. Now after the Sabbath day, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great shaking, for the angel of the Lord, having descended from heaven and approached, rolled away the stone and was sitting on it. His appearance was as lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. And from fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, you need not fear, for you see, I know that you are seeking the crucified Jesus. He is not here, for he was raised to life, just as he said, come here, see the place where he was lying. Then you must go quickly to tell his disciples that he was raised to life from the dead. Now look, he is going before you into Galilee, There you will see him. See, I have told you. So departing quickly from the tomb, with fear, yet with great joy, they ran to tell his disciples. And suddenly Jesus met them, saying, Good morning. And coming to him, they grasped his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go, tell my disciples, my brothers, to leave for Galilee. Indeed, there they will see me. Meanwhile, as they were going, some of the guard went into the city to tell the chief priests everything that had happened. So after the priests had assembled with the elders and had devised the plot, they gave the soldiers a considerable sum of money, saying, you're to say his disciples came during the night and stole him while we were sleeping. If this thing reaches the ears of the governor, we will bribe him and thereby keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this lie has been spread widely among the Jews to this day. Now the eleven disciples had gone to Galilee, to the mountain Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but some still doubted. Then Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go, make disciples of all nations, by baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and by teaching them to keep everything I have commanded you. Now see, I am with you every day to the end of the age. In our day, pandemic has added complexity to our lives. Uh, For me, uh, it's warped my sense of time. Uh, I was first invited here before COVID-19 hit the United States. It's only six months ago, but it feels like years. And suddenly we're here. Uh, It's mid-September now. We're still relatively restricted, uh, not quite sure about tomorrow. And... We're wondering if there's an end to COVID in sight. I passed my exams. Uh, The house is sold. Our dog is safe. Uh, Tommy is at Eastern Christian. Our daughter's at University of Pennsylvania. Emily has kept her job. The really odd thing is waking up every day in New Jersey. (laughs) So I've been reflecting on the past months. Perhaps you've had the same experience. I recall late spring and we began to see our neighbors walking about. They seemed more numerous, 
uh, more talkative than in the old normal. Uh, they shared their COVID stories and conspiracy theories. And then summer arrived, uh, the for sale sign went up, and they asked what I was doing. A Jewish woman surprised me by asking for a link to my sermons. Her husband replied, I thought it was all made up stories. A lapsed Catholic scoffed, religion is what's wrong with the world. Another openly admitted her need for spirituality. And then add to COVID the tragedy of George Floyd, anger, societal unrest, violence, and a forthcoming election. And many seem to be inquiring, is this the end times? Now, COVID has disrupted the rhythm of our lives, and recent troubles have rattled our sense of justice, identity, and direction. There's a new creed, a new inquisition. But I wonder, will people get woke to their alienation from God and neighbor? It's unlikely. Troubles do not ground repentance. God's grace and mercy do. Now, my assumption is that our unbelieving neighbors have no real blueprint for life in a post-Christian world. Chesterton was right. When people choose not to believe in God, they do not thereafter believe in nothing. They then become capable of believing in anything. So my question is, have the same people rejected gospel grace, or have they never truly heard? What's a Christian to do? Well, the answer begins with the Great Commission in Matthew 28. The Lord has become Lord of the world. Sovereign over the creation that he made originally good, he has come to reclaim and rescue it and set everything right. He has a power, a power embracing heaven and earth, and we have a mission, a disciple-making mission based on his authorization. Christians proclaim Christ the Lord as God's saving gift and participation in Christ by the Spirit as God's blueprint for life on earth as in heaven. So how does a Christian recover their sense of time? Well, the answer begins by discovering life within Jesus' story. It's a story we rehearse every Lord's Day. Christ has died. Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Isn't he why we're here this morning? From the first Lord's Day to the day the Lord returns, worshiping the exalted Christ is our most significant privilege. But worship is not our primary task. The Great Commission is. My main point is that Christ has a church for his mission in the world. And I have three sub-points. First, the Great Commission is founded upon the resurrection of the crucified Christ. Second, the Great Commission begins with faithful testimony to the open and empty tomb. And third, the Great Commission sends us into the world as disciples, empowered to make other disciples for the universal recognition of the risen Lord every day to the end of the age. Now, verse 1 sets the scene on Sunday. It's after the Jewish Sabbath, the dawning of a new day. Two women, Mary Magdalene and another Mary, having observed the Sabbath, waited till the following dawn to see the tomb. They're honoring a well-known early Jewish burial custom. According to the rabbinic tractate, Semachot, for three days, as required, these two women would have visited the tomb, surely with sadness, to confirm Jesus' death and burial. They're witnesses. What they see there this morning signifies the import of this new day as the dawn of a new era in history. And these women are seeing everything. All the elements of their experience recall prophetic signs expected to accompany the coming of the Lord and the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. 
The great earthquake foretold by Zechariah moves the great stone. And these two Marys had first seen this stone being rolled to close the entrance of the tomb at Jesus' burial. They had also seen the tomb subsequently sealed and guarded by Roman soldiers. And so there would have been no time when it remained open and unobserved. But they see it open this day. For the angel of the Lord has descended from heaven to roll away the stone and is sitting on it now in an elevated, triumphant pose. The angel's appearance recalls Jesus' transfiguration. His visage is like lightning, his clothing white as snow. The earthquake and the appearance of the heavenly being shakes the guards too. White with fright, face down, their prostrate posture signals that the Lord brings Roman might to naught. Ironically, it's the soldiers, not Jesus, who now lie as dead ones. Calvin writes this, the soldiers, accustomed to tumult, were so struck with panic that they fell down half dead. No power raised them from the ground, but in the like alarm of the women, a comfort soon came to restore their spirits. The reassurance comes when the angel proclaims the Christian message. It's a message proclaimed to them in terms recalling Paul's gospel from 1 Corinthians 15. Fear not, the angel says, for you see, I know that you are seeking the crucified Jesus. He's not here, for he was raised to life, just as he said. Thus the angel interprets the empty tomb. Jesus, who died and was buried, has been raised to life. And then he offers supporting evidence. Come here. See where he was lying. And so the women's testimony of sight confirms the angel's prophetic declaration. There is no reason to fear. The events that had brought about Jesus' humiliation and death have been overcome by Jesus' exaltation and life. It's a momentous event. The momentous event refutes the disbelief of the Sadducees who had discounted any talk of resurrection. And before the Pharisees, it vindicates Jesus as a true prophet. Rabbi Jesus, teacher of disciples, had predicted this day. Recall Matthew 27. Uh, there it tells us how the chief priests and Pharisees had resorted to Pontius Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that at, while he was still alive, that deceiver said, After three days I will rise again. In Matthew 26, Jesus had also indicated to his disciples that after his resurrection, he would go ahead of them into Galilee. So he is risen. And so to Galilee, the women must go, for there they will see him just as he said. And so they make quick response to the angel's command, departing in fear, because they witnessed an awe-inspiring mystery, but departing with great joy, too, because of the message that Christ is risen, just as the angel also told them. No wonder they run to tell the disciples. And just then, as suddenly as the earthquake had signaled the angel's descent, Jesus himself appears to them. Good morning, he says, as if to greet the new creation too. They recognize him immediately, and they bow before him appropriately. Worship is the right response and the proper privilege of these women. They'd set out that day with sorrow to confirm Jesus' crucifixion death but with great joy. They have joined the angel, and Jesus himself is among the first witnesses to resurrection life. Have you ever wondered what resurrection life means for Jesus? It's really the crucial question. What Jesus has experienced is the end of the old age and the dawning of the new. Sunday 
is the day recognized within early Judaism to commence after a period of seven days or weeks of years, as Daniel 9 puts it. It's the eighth day. It's the first day of a new creation week. It's what we call the Lord's Day, and it commemorates this first day in realization of God's plan to bring everything to a head in Jesus Christ. So with his resurrection, the age to come is powerfully present. The new creation has dawned. Nothing will ever be the same again. Jesus has inaugurated the new order, and now is the time of salvation. Paul puts it like this in Romans. By his resurrection, Jesus is declared to be the Son of God in power. That is, Christ himself has entered a new stage in his own history. The exaltation of the crucified Jesus declares him to be, as Son of God, what he was not heretofore. The Messiah has moved from a stage of humiliation to one of exaltation, from a period of suffering to one of glory. He was crucified in weakness, but now he lives in power. So the gospel is Christ the Son of God who has become man and entered into the present evil age with all that that involved for him, but was raised up by the Spirit, vindicated by his Father, and constituted the source of the age to come. And so for Jesus, resurrection means that Christ is enthroned. He is the world's true Lord. As Son of God in power, Jesus can now serve as the source and resource for his disciples' mission. He's the resurrected Lord. He is the author of the life-giving spiritual existence that distinguishes this new age. Note then why the two women must go to tell the disciples. Their journey is founded upon Jesus' resurrection. But they go because the angel has commissioned them to tell the eleven about the open and empty tomb. This is what vindicates Jesus' own words about his resurrection. But it's more than this. Jesus raised from death to life is much more than the fulfillment of a prophecy. It's rather a further illustration of everything Jesus had taught them about his messianic role and their life in following him. He was like the prophets before him, wrongly persecuted because of his loyalty to the Father. But he has gained great reward and justification by his resurrection. He's also confirmed as the one who finds his life after losing it, as the servant of all who has become great, greatest of all. And as he who became last, and so also has become first. The message Jesus expressed in his teaching, you see, is embodied in Jesus' cross and resurrection. And so the women witness, and therefore they're able to revitalize Jesus' disciples, the eleven, as his followers and apostles. It's not surprising, then, that Jesus, now as a second witness, repeats to the women the angel's consolation and the angel's commission. The prophetic words of comfort, fear not, remind them again that death has no hold upon Jesus. Then comes the charge, go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee. Indeed, as he said, there they will see me. Now, at this point, we can pause to summarize several features of their message. What follows must not be missed. These two women are two witnesses. They testify, first, that the tomb is open, that the stone was rolled away by the angel, and second, that the tomb is empty, for Jesus is raised from life, for life from the dead. Jesus is raised to life. Third, they've seen Jesus themselves. 
and he has been raised bodily. In other words, the women have not only seen him, they have taken hold of his feet in worship. Dell Allison has shown, I think fascinatingly, that throughout world folklore, ghosts often have no feet. Never thought of it. He concludes, the grasping of feet indicates that Jesus is not a spirit. Jesus is a true man. He is raised bodily. And so these women, therefore, are the first among those with 1 John who have heard him speak, have seen him with their eyes, have touched him with their hands. And they're also the first to proclaim him as the word of life. Fourth, they would surely tell his disciples that the Lord has called them brothers. Brothers. The eleven, as we will soon meet them without Judas, are the foundation stones of Christ's church. And by virtue of Jesus' resurrection, their apostolic identity is joined to their identity as children of the Heavenly Father. He calls them brothers. And this denotes Jesus' recognition of them as his own kin. And it connotes his forgiveness of their sins. How easy, then, to join pardon for sin and the privilege of worship to the pleasure of testifying about him. Of course, these two women aren't the only witnesses. We see this from the contrast that Matthew now sets up between the true and the false witnesses in verses 11 to 15. Here, again, Jew and Gentile concoct a rumor circulated by the guards and shared widely among the Jews. Note that at first the soldiers tell the truth. They report to the chief priests and the elders everything that had happened. And then the chief priests provide their own interpretation of the evidence. Plainly, their reaction is not to dispute the historicity of the open and empty tomb. Instead, they bribe these guards to propagate a lie that Jesus' disciples have stolen the body while the soldiers were sleeping. And this is ironic because this deception is the very threat to the truth that they'd presented to Pilate in calling Jesus a deceiver. And yet it's, it's they who've become guilty of fraud. And it's not the first time that they've purchased opposition to Jesus. And tragically, Jesus' resurrection hasn't changed them at all. Their boast from chapter 27, let him come down from the cross and then we'll believe in him, was empty. W.D. Davies writes, having failed to prevent the resurrection, the chief priests are reduced to trying to render it unbelievable. But we know the guards weren't sleeping. Slumbering guards? Come on. Such testimony is self-incriminating. The rumor of theft is a self-serving lie, fortified by the love of money, which these guards took. Once the Jewish leaders pledged to protect their false witness by bribing the governor too, they did as they were taught and published the lie. Now note this well. The phrase, as taught, identifies these guards as disciples too, disciples of another master. They're false, to be sure, like Judas, who also took the silver. But with Judas, they have obeyed their master. And so both Jew and Gentile conspire against Jesus once again. And this last deception in lying about his resurrection is worse than the first in putting him to death. There's no middle ground here. You see, one is either a disciple of Jesus and truth or of the enemy and lies. And so in all of life, we are expressing and we are embodying testimony either for Jesus or against Jesus. As one's taught, 
True disciples may stumble and doubt, but since they belong to Jesus, they need not fear the accuser of the brethren and the father of lies. The gates of hell will not prevail against Christ's church. And this brings us to my third point, which concerns the disciples' task unfolded in the concluding commission. It's important to recognize that this commission is tethered to the preceding events. The Great Commission is founded upon Jesus' resurrection. It begins with faithful testimony to the meaning of the open and empty tomb and the light that radiates from the open and empty tomb is sufficient to transform the entire world. Note then that the Great Commission does two things. First, it calls us to proclaim the Lordship of Jesus as a present reality. Jesus is Lord but one not yet universally recognized. Second, it teaches Jesus' apostles the means for extending God's grace throughout the world. Since Christ is raised in power, the church's message presumes his cosmic authority. Redemption is achieved, Jesus is Lord. The present evil age has lost its ability to hold people captive, for the age to come has broken in to rescue us. And now, as Abraham Kuyper said, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Yet Christ's work in reclaiming the world is not yet complete. And so, both in cosmic terms for the creation and in personal terms for the disciple, there remains a further step. There will be a different level of fulfillment and victory at the end of the age when Christ returns. And so this gives us the context for our existence. This gives us our temporal location by which we know what we're to do and how we're to understand our life in the world. Disciples exist and our mission is executed in the space between these two phases of Jesus' coming. The Great Commission takes place between the resurrection of Jesus and the bodily resurrection of those who belong to Jesus. We serve God as those poised between the victory over death at Easter and the final victory when Jesus appears again. This is the period that the New Testament calls the last days. Is it the end times? Yes, since Jesus was raised and until he comes again. In these last days, Jesus' redemptive work is being applied by the Spirit in and through the church. And so as Jesus' disciples, you and I, we have a strategic role in Jesus' kingdom-building project. Christ has saved us and gathered us in order to send us for the sake of his mission in the world. Wherever he has placed you, whatever you do for a living, whoever he brings into your life, until he returns. That's our reason for being. And it's reflected in the pattern of our worshiping together on the Lord's day. God summons us, sanctifies us, speaks to us, and strengthens us in order to send us into the world to make more disciples. Sunday's our privilege, but our task every day is to make disciples by expressing and embodying true testimony about our risen Savior. Christ the Lord commands it. That's why he stands on top of the mountain Sinai-like, as a new Moses. And from this height, before his own gathered assembly, he surveys the earth. They're like the 12 sons of Jacob, these 11 disciples minus Judas. Only 11. 
the nucleus of the new people of God. And so as the new Moses, Jesus commissions them, as he'd previously commanded them in the Sermon on the Mount. But Jesus is more than a new and great prophet. He is the ruler over all. Unlike Moses, he does not go and die in the desert. He lives. And God has handed him all authority so that he can both command and guarantee that God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Consequently, the mission is to all nations. His church is Catholic, universal, that is with all nations, including the fulfillment, uh, indicating the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12. Through his offspring, beginning with Jesus, and the entire Abrahamic family united to him, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Jesus' command to make disciples internationally means that that promise is being fulfilled in the mission of the church as the new Abrahamic family of faith. It's a universal lordship, and this means the church has a universal mission. And so for Jesus' disciples, the commission is to make more disciples by baptizing and teaching them to observe all that King Jesus had commanded. Not just the imperatives, but the Beatitudes the parables, the prophecies, every aspect of Jesus' life in both word and deed. Baptism marks us as Jesus' disciples in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so Christian baptism replaces Jewish circumcision as the ritual of entry for the people of God. Water baptism into the one divine name is the sign and the seal of our union with Christ, of admittance into the church, of belonging to God. And so by taking up the command to teach all that Jesus taught, the church becomes an extension of Jesus' ministry in calling people as lifelong learners and servants of the risen Lord. What is a disciple? A disciple trusts Jesus, loves Jesus, learns from Jesus. A disciple imitates Jesus' self-giving love in love and service to God and neighbor. And so consequently, a disciple grows, grows in knowing the Lord, in becoming like the Lord, in doing the Lord's will. And it's in this way that disciples become mission fit, able to make more disciples, characterized by the same love and the same loyalty to God. It's a tall order. Worship and nurture happen here. But making disciples begins out there by seeking lost people. It involves identifying new circles for serving and building relationships in the community. It involves being a good neighbor and practicing hospitality, being salt and light into the world, right? preserving the truth, and dispelling the darkness. It involves prayer and skill and spiritual conversation. And so we have much work to do. A few weeks ago, a minister said to me, Living Word is a wonderful church, but you'll need to do a lot of outreach. And of course, he's right. The Dutch culture of your ancestors was pro-Christian, pro-church, and pro-pastor. In Patterson, and after you first moved here, you could open the door on Sunday and people would fill the pews. There was little need for outreach or evangelism. Your culture 
did the outreach for you. And evangelism meant presenting the gospel to those who came every Sunday. It's no longer the case. Today, American culture is anti-pastor, anti-church, and anti-Christian. And so, yes, we must do outreach, but outreach will not be enough. Let me explain uh, with the words of Ken Pretty. Ken writes this, many church leaders mistake outreach for evangelism. Outreach is when people inside the church reach out to people outside the church to build relationships, usually by addressing the needs and interests of those outsiders. It's great. Evangelism is when people with faith are connected to a crystal clear gospel message. If the gospel has not been made crystal clear, while outreach may have happened, evangelism has not happened. In other words, we must serve. We must build relationships. We must look to the interests of others and our neighbors. But as we engage our neighbors, we must not be afraid to make the gospel call. That is, we invite the person with whom we're sharing to turn and put their faith in Christ. To use the language of our tradition, effectual calling and regeneration is the work of the Holy Spirit. But we are charged by God with making the gospel call. J.I. Packer puts it this way, if we're not seeking to bring about conversions, we're not evangelizing. We may be serving. We may be building relationships, but we're not making disciples. But how lovely the feet of those who bring good news. The next phase is nurture, which involves teaching new disciples how to pray and study scripture, how to worship, why do we think people know how to worship out in our culture? They're unbelievers. Worship is a reorientation of the heart. We need to teach people how to serve, to give generously and discover gifts, and how to share the gospel themselves. Nurture involves Sunday school <clears throat> and small groups and mentoring and coaching, life on life, to teach people all that Christ commands. It involves growth towards healthy relationships, for integrity at home and work and school, for flourishing as a single or in marriage. Nurture involves fellowship and discipline, praying with and for one another, bearing one another's burdens, providing care and encouragement, helping those in need, developing godly character, and exercising our gifts for ministry and leadership in the community. Jesus says nothing about a light and sound stage to change the world. It's not a competition to attract people by the hottest programs and the latest musical styles, nor is it about welcoming them, welcoming them here as they are. It's about going to them where they are and telling them about God's gift of Christ, given to them without regard for who they are, or what they've done, or what they haven't done. To do this, we need Christ. We need his word and spirit. We need his love and our trust and our obedience, for his power is perfected in our weakness. And so in these and many other ways, living word must live out the Great Commission. Brothers and sisters, we are called to take up the cross and follow Christ. We have much work to do, but it's ultimately Christ's work. Our setting is a discouraging one, but he is equal to the task. He is with us, and we see this from verse 20. By virtue of his cross and resurrection, Christ has the authority and the power to secure his objectives. He remains Emmanuel, God with us. 
We're told this at the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, before all of the suffering and the pain and the darkness of crucifixion. But he is Emmanuel in resurrection. And he remains eternally present with us by the Spirit everywhere, all the time, so that we may fulfill this great commission from Easter to the end of the age. And so worship is our great privilege. But this commission is our great purpose. It's our reason for being, not only on the Lord's day, but every day to the end of the age. We see God is seeking and God is saving the lost so that gathered with us, they too will become part of Christ's body to worship God in spirit and truth. The hour is here. Today is the day of salvation. Our calling as Christ's disciples is to participate in Christ's mission in the world every day until he returns in glory. Amen. Let us respond by singing, Ye servants of God, your master proclaim. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim. <clears throat> Please be seated. If you're still with me, uh, do you have um, the um, elements such as they are? Uh, this is my first time doing this, so I'll acknowledge my uh, nervousness, and I have um, some words to share with you and an invitation. And after the words of institution, then we'll uh, take some time to pray. Our Lord Jesus Christ instituted the Lord's Supper to be observed by his church until he returns. It commemorates the once for all sacrifice of himself on the cross for our sins. The bread and the wine point as signs to the crucified body and shed blood of our Savior. 
It is a means of grace. A means of grace by which God feeds us with the crucified and exalted Christ. He is present with us uniquely and spiritually as we are caught up to heaven with him as discerned by faith. The supper is a bond and pledge of the union we have with him and of the communion we share with one another as members of his body. And so the Lord's Supper signifies and seals the forgiveness of sins and our spiritual growth and nurture in Christ Jesus. By this supper, God calls us as Christian believers to deeper gratitude for our salvation and to more faithful love and service in obedience to God and to one another. So it's my privilege to invite all who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, including any baptized and confessing member of this church or any other congregation which believes and preaches the gospel to this table. If you trust in Jesus, if you've repented of your sin and covenant to live by faith as Jesus' disciple and rest upon him alone for salvation, this table, this supper, is for you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, right, testifying, and embodying, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Take a moment for silent prayer and a self-examination, and then I will lead us as we pray together with the Lord's Prayer. Merciful God, we praise you for your mighty power and grace in bringing salvation. We confess our unworthiness to come to the table on our own, and we affirm our trust in Christ's righteousness and mediation. We thank you for these elements. We ask that you would use them for their intended purpose. Grant that by faith we may feed upon Jesus Christ, crucified and raised for us, so that being strengthened by grace, we might live in him and for him, walking by faith and by the powerful working of the Holy Spirit in us, personally and corporately. To this end, we recommit ourselves to Christ and to each other, pleading that the Holy Spirit will make this sacrament effectual to build us up and so strengthen us through Christ our Lord. And so we pray as he taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Everything is ready. Taste and see how good the Lord is. Uh, the bread is at the top. So if you can figure it out. Um, The bread we break is communion in the body of Christ.
never thought it would be easier to uh, pass it out row by row. cup of blessing, cup of the new covenant, communion in the blood of Christ. Please uh, join me again in prayer. Gracious and merciful Father, we thank you and praise you for we have been fed at the table of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're grateful for your gift of Christ and the Spirit, and we're mindful of the communion of the saints. And so we offer you our prayers for our members and friends and for all people everywhere. God of all mercy, we remember those in our midst who may be struggling financially perhaps due to, to the pandemic or other means, and we ask that you would provide for them and, and that you would use us to assist them as, as we love one another. For the afflicted and for the sick, Father, please heal and strengthen Anne-Marie Bremen, John Meyer, Jeanette Prommel, Ken Short, Nancy Van Beveren. Father, please keep Marlo Koistra in good health and cancer-free. We thank you for how you've healed him. Father, we also pray for those who grieve the loss of loved ones, and I think especially of the Musikowski family on the loss of Jack's mother. Comfort them, Father. And console those, too, who grieve in remembrance of 9-11-2001. Father, we pray for those serving in law enforcement and in at-risk jobs during these times of pandemic and social unrest. We ask for peace in our nation and throughout the world, for true biblical justice and reconciliation in our own society, for godly and wise leadership at all levels of our government. We pray that your will be done in our upcoming elections. Father, we pray too for those serving in our armed forces, and I think particularly of the training and deployment of Sergeant Anthony and Sergeant Daniel Figueroa. Keep them safe, prepare them well. We pray above all for the advance of the gospel here in North Halden and throughout our region, throughout our country, indeed to the ends of the earth. We thank you for the faithful gospel ministry of John Dykeson, John Bosch, and John Algara in our midst. We ask that you would bless Michael Johnson preaching at Cedar Hill this morning. We ask that you would bless our supported missionaries, Bob and Pat Grayman of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. Provide for their needs and make them effective in their labors for the cause of Jesus Christ. As Christ sends us out into the world, Father, please look upon us in our struggle on the earth. Strengthen our faith. Give us courage in the exercise of our gifts in word and deed and inspire our witness to all people, today and every day, to the end of the age. Father, may our eyes and ears, our hearts and thoughts, be fixed upon Jesus Christ, your Son, the only Savior and our Lord. To him be glory with you, Father, through the Holy Spirit, both now and forevermore. Amen. And we'll sing, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. The verses will be projected for you.
Go into all the world. Serve. Build relationships. Love your neighbor as yourself. And share with them in love the good news of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God our Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen. Go and serve the Lord.